Welcome to Online Church again. You know, many of us are feeling um, this stress of not being together, kind of a, a gray cloud some days over us. And the Lord reminded me that His Word says, do not forsake the assembly of the saints. We were created to be together as we worship. So we're praying and we know the Lord is making a way that we will be together again soon in the same building. But we want you to know that we really miss you and miss being together. So let the distractions of the day go for a while. Find a comfortable place to sit down and tune in as we join together as a family to worship Jesus today.
We believe that giving of our finances is simply another way that we worship God. You know, the tithe is simply returning a portion of all that God has blessed us with. The tithe keeps the local church functioning week in and week out. So we thank you for continuing faithfully to give the tithe. If you're part of the Gathering family, we have four ways to give. Our website, thegatheringfamily.com. You can give on your phone on an app called Secure Give. You can text to give, or you can simply mail a check from right there in your home. So we thank you for your faithfulness week in and week out to give the tithes to your local church to keep us functioning in a healthy way. Now, if you've joined us over the last few weeks, you know that we're in the middle of our missions offering for 2020. We give this offering together every year from Passover to Pentecost. If you want to give to the missions offering, look for that designation online. You'll find it there or simply write it in the memo of your check so we can get the missions money exactly where it needs to go. And today we want to share with you the fourth and final cause of our missions offering for 2020. It's near and dear to my heart. It is the house of prayer. I'm the prayer director here at the Gathering Church, so this is one of the reasons that I get up every day is to worship and pray as a corporate body. You know, prayer is the opposite side of the coin for missions. They cannot be separated. The Word of God, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, pray that the gospel go quickly and be effective. The prayer movement in the earth is the fuel in the engine of the missions movement. So it's the foundation of all that we do here as a church family, worship and prayer. So lean in as we share our heart with you here about the house of prayer. I have given my life to this, partnering with Jesus to build the house of prayer because my life was changed, totally changed, transformed in a corporate prayer meeting. The presence of God came and in 30 minutes, uh, God transformed my life uh, the last 39 years leading up to that. I mean, I was a different person in a half an hour. So my passion, the passion of my heart that drives me is to get people and push them in to the presence of God because I know that it's there in that place that their whole lives will be transformed by what He can do in and through them in those moments. Yeah, we've already started to see a whole lot of this happen even in just the short time we've been doing this. We've seen, we've stopped prayer meetings because people came in for healing and overnight seen transformation in their lives. We've seen people lay down cigarettes after 40 years of addiction yes. from just being in the presence of God. Infants with um, serious life-threatening heart problems healed in the prayer room, verified mm -hmm. with uh, doctors' information from hospitals that yeah. these people were healed. I mean, we have watched God one by one not to mention the joy that people have found from the presence of God when they have encountered Him in that place. He's given them their joy back. It just lifted anxiety, depression from so many people through being in His presence. Just over time, it has become transformative for our whole corporate body. Yeah, one of my favorite things to see, and we see this so much, is musicians who God has put something in their heart and they didn't know what to do with it for years and years. And they find this place of ministry to God. They find this place where what He's put in their heart can finally be released. It's why I've given my life to this now. It's, he, he put together all those things that have been in my heart for years and years. And He, and he showed them to me so clearly. And I just remember thinking, yes, this is something I want to give my life to build. A place where we minister to Jesus unending, night and day, but just because He's worthy of it. Jesus has become the reward. He is the one above and beyond any other reward. He's the reward that we go after now and that we have become so satisfied with. 
when I look at the Old Testament, the priests and the Levites who, who chose to live their life ministering and worshiping God, their reward was different from the other tribes. They didn't get the physical, tangible rewards of land and things for their tribe. Their reward, it says in the scripture, was God himself. We have learned that all of those other benefits that we've gotten are so good, and God loves to bless His children. But if none of those existed now, if not one tangible, like physical thing we could see with our eyes happened, we've learned that Jesus is the reward that we want. That being with Him, dwelling, with him in his presence giving him our hearts and receiving his heart partnering with him to see his desires fulfilled in the earth that has become the reward of our life as a people yeah i love the story that in the new testament with jesus and mary and martha martha's running around doing this and that preparing for dinner doing all these things and mary is just found sitting at jesus's feet and Martha even comes in and she says, Lord, won't you tell her to get up and help me? There's so much to do. Like, she's just sitting here. And Jesus says, no, Martha, she's found, the, she's found the good thing. She's found the one thing. And I think at the end of the day, as a group of people, we have just given ourselves to be like Mary, to go after the one thing and to be fully consumed with the man, Jesus Christ, realizing he's worthy of our time, He's worthy of our worship, and ultimately, we just know that He is worthy of it all. So as you see, this room is so much more than just a place where we come to worship Jesus. And it requires a lot to maintain its function. Staff members, worship leaders, technology to raise the awareness of prayer in our area. And personal life change is happening in the house of prayer. People finding their purpose, people being physically healed, emotionally and mentally healed, finding their joy again in the presence of God. Strangers walking in off the street just out of curiosity and being saved. And all of this is because you have helped us and invested in the house of prayer. So for five years, we say thank you for your generosity in giving to the house of prayer. And we look forward to many more years ahead, partnering together to build the house of prayer in our region. Welcome to Online Church Today. And I'm so thankful for those of you that are tuning in and listening to the Word of the Lord. We want to make sure that you are getting spiritually fed in this season. Now, I want to dive right in because I don't have much time today. I want to just make sure that you take last week's teaching and today's teaching and if you didn't get a chance to hear it, go back and listen to it. But the Lord's been asking me this question, Gene, what are you praying that is an impossibility? And he gave me this verse in Matthew, and I want you to see it because I'm going to dive right into this thought. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And last week, I talked about these common ordinary, and if not careful, not to take away from the seriousness of any prayer at any time talking to God, but there's just something about it when we get out of the boat and we start praying these prayers, they're, they're audacious, they're gargantuous, they're, there's no way it's going to happen in the natural. Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still, and it did. In a moment, I'm going to tell you an answer to one of these prayers where the Lord taught me a tremendous lesson of when I had given up over something that I saw as impossible. So we've got to understand that the Lord sometimes, uh, let me use this word, sometimes God just wants to bump us up. 
He wants our faith to go to a new level, asking for the impossible. And sometimes we just get in this routine of just common, ordinary prayers. And beloved, it's not healthy for the soul. It's not healthy for the song. I'll talk about that in a moment. The song we sing determines the joy we get to manifest. Look at this verse here. The apostle Paul wrote it in the book of Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do three key words in here, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power of, the same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead, the Bible says that same resurrection power lives in us. Now, if you'll think about that, meditate on that, that in and of itself has the, the, that revelation to change how you should think about your prayer life. That same power that brought him out of that grave, that same power that parted the Red Sea, that same power that when Jesus spoke to the blind, they were healed, spoke to the lame man, healed. All of that power of God that we see operating in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that power of God is stored up inside of us. Now watch, I'm going to show you the meaning of these words here. I want you to see them. Exceedingly abundantly, above all. It means to an unusual degree. That should describe our prayer life. Abundantly, generously, lavishly. We're not to walk around depressed, discouraged, defeated. I think I read it uh, earlier. There's something like over 7 Thousand, I think 7,487, don't quote me, but there's that many promises in the Word of God. Think about that. But if we're not letting the power in us, you say, what, what do you mean the power in us? The power of faith. According to your faith, it will be done unto you. The power of confession. We have the right to confess, believe, stand in agreement with God. That power that's at work in us, the power of worship, the power of praise, or the, the power of thanksgiving, the power of God literally that is working in us does exceedingly, abundantly, above all. Let's go back and look at this verse again. I want you to get the revelation of this. Look at it in Ephesians. Let's read it. Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly for Gene, Gene's family, Gene's sons, any circumstance that arises, I can do exceedingly abundantly, Gene, above all that you would ever even ask or even think. This has the power, if you allow it to grip you, to begin to pray some impossible prayers. You know, I said this last week on the teaching that this has so captured me, I have as not, I have not yet even written down this prayer because I want it to be born of God. I want it to have the right motive of it. I was sharing with my mother this last week what I was going to teach on it, and she said, oh, I love that, praying the impossible. And I shared with her that that's just what the Lord has me thinking and meditating on. And she said to me, she said, well, what are you going to begin to pray for? And I said, I don't know, Mom. I want it to be born when I pray a prayer over my son, when I pray over prayer over my youngest son, or I pray a prayer over this church. I would like to say, hey, I had at least one, at least two, at least three. Impossible. There's no way it would have ever happened. Well, it will not happen for you. It will not happen for me if we don't recognize this power that is available within us. And, and I shared this verse with you last week because this is critical. I want you to see it. It's in the book of James, okay? 
You do not have because you do not ask God. We usually stop somewhere there. When you ask, you do not receive. So we're always quoting that. We have not because we ask not. But beloved, listen to me. I don't have time to teach on it, but motive is everything. Motive is everything. You've got to come to the Lord with this, this heart that, that is humble, contrite, real, authentic, genuine, God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. There's just something about how we approach God when we start asking God for the big, the miraculous. We, you cannot, he who ascends unto the hill of the Lord has clean hands and a pure heart. We, I understand the blood, I understand that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, but the Lord is still holy. We come to the throne of grace. We come boldly to the throne of grace. But it is so critical that if this is capturing you and you're, you're going to leave this thought, leave this teaching, knowing that I'm going to pray for that man, that uncle, that, that father-in-law, that my dad, that it's just for years they've rejected the gospel. For years they've said no to Christ. But you just, you're just you going to hold on to the horn of the altar and begin to pray for their salvation when everybody in the family has doubted that they'll ever give their life to Christ. And everybody said, hey, no way. You are going to hold on and believe for the salvation of that one man. You are. Well, I can tell you, that when you're praying that, the will of God is the Word of God. So I check my motive against the Word. The Bible said that He's not willing that any should perish. So if I'm praying for the salvation of a man, then I'm coming in agreement with God's Word because the will of God is the Word of God. And when I come in agreement with the Word of God, that keeps my motive correct. But if I jump over into another field and start praying for God to bless me financially, that could be maybe a little bit more gray because then the motive would, well, why do you want the money? Why do you need that money? And so the motive has to stay in check. Be careful that you don't hear this teaching and you just write something down. That, that, would be, that would not be wise. That would not be clear and understanding of what Scripture said. We have not because we're asking not, but James said, your motive's wrong. And no one set the standard for this any better than King David. And that's why I introduced him to you last week. I want you to see him, look at him. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt. And last week I dealt with this because I knew I wanted to come out of the gate because I'm still going on record right now to say the number one reason many people will back off and shy away from this and not really just let faith explode inside of them and just really get out of the boat and say, God be God, save my lost uncle. God, fulfill that dream in my life, and I'm going to at least pray one prayer like Joshua where the sun stood still for the victory. I'm going to pray at least one prayer in my life. If it takes 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years, I'm going to lock in and I'm going to pray that prayer. And I know with man, it's impossible. But with God, it is possible. The reason most believers will not ever lock into that is because they're living under such shame and guilt. And you got to understand, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, period. We have to understand the mindset of a son and a daughter. We have that 
access. You need to fundamentally understand at any time in your life, you can come before the throne room of God and he's willing to forgive. We can be honest with him. And just like you want to reward your children, he wants to reward us. So don't live in that guilt. Don't live in that shame. And if the enemy's beating you up over a 25-year-long addiction and you've struggled with that addiction for 25 or 30 years, whether it be alcohol, smoking, pornography, any addiction at all, God is willing and able to set you free. I know you don't see it that it could even be possible because you've lived with this all of your life. But yet, beloved, do not allow the guilt and the shame to rob you of the greatness and the beauty and the splendor and the power of God and the grace of God fully operating in your life. Don't let the guilt Come before the Lord in complete honesty. David knew he was so confident. I love this about him. I, I said it last week. He was, all, he was the most confident man in all of Scripture to play the mercy card. He knew how to play it. He, he, he was a man that Scripture does just the best job showing all of his weaknesses and all of his failures. I mean, his laundry is out for the world to see it. But still yet, he would come back and be so confident in the grace of God and the mercy of God. And again, he would say to God, here I am again. And when he got in his presence, he would ask him for these audacious victories, whether it was slaying a giant or winning a war that was absolutely impossible. He knew, he was confident in this. I like how Mike Bickle said it. He's the standard. Man, that's a good word. He's the standard for us to see how God worked in his life because the same way God worked in his life, he wants to work in our life. So let that lock into you. Don't let the guilt and the shame. Now, Verse 3, it kind of gets a little bit wild here, okay, because this has become uh, a buzzword. So let's just keep going. I want you to see this, okay? When I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away. See this word right here? When I refuse to confess my sin. I'm 56 years old. I'll be 57 years old. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about something just for a moment, so just dial in. There is a gigantic community out here uh, in the grace movement that they teach grace, they shout grace, they're all about grace, and let me say this, I'm with them because I believe in the undeserved, unmerited, unearned grace of God. And where sin doth abound, much more is grace. Now, right out of the gate, I, I know this to be a fact. You can go and research it. So we all know that if you've studied this revolution of grace that's going on in the earth, and I thank God for it. One of my favorite teachers, uh, Joseph Prince, and another one of my favorite teachers is Mike Bickle. I love them both, great men of God. They ask Joseph Prince, do you confess sins? You personally? His answer was, yes, because I like, I love this, staying honest before God. So, for those of you that are going to take the position that I'm no longer going to confess sin, I'm telling you I believe that's a little bit dangerous. Now, I'm going to show you in a verse in a moment, but let's keep going. I want you to kind of build this thought right here. Let's go. So I want you to see this. 
If we confess our sins, this is the, the big one, 1 John 1. Nine. And, you know, who is it written to? Was it written to the believer or to the agnostic? We won't go there, but this one is controversial. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I want you to dial into this. Literally, the word here, confess, is the Greek word homologio. Literally, it means just to come in alignment. In other words, what God says is sin is sin. So I'm not kind of conjuring up or making up what I feel is sin or is not sin. See, the standard is or the absolute is the Word of God. So when I begin to confess my sins, it's not that it's just verbiage. I'm coming and I'm saying literally, God, what you say is sin, I'm saying the same thing. Now, that's important because that allows us to come into the throne room of God where David said, when I came, I was honest with God. God said, David, that's adultery. David, that's murder. David, you messed up. David said, you're right, God. It's not that you're going to sit around here and let the culture build your belief system. See, you're going to let this build your belief system, and you're going to say what God says about sin. You're going to say the same thing. Now, do I believe this? Because you hear this all the time. I've never dealt with this, but I want to go somewhere. Do I believe this? Gene, today are all my past, my present, and my future sins under the blood. Gene, I've heard you say this. How many sins had I committed when Jesus died on the cross? Let me help you. As far as I know, logically, when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, I had not committed any sins. I was not born yet. So if I had not been born the day he died on the cross, tell me how many sins I had committed. Zero. But the Bible said, we know this, God is outside of time. So the cross is bigger than time. If God was inside of time, time would be bigger than God. But God's outside of time. Therefore, the Bible said, before the foundations of the earth, even before Jesus died on the cross before the foundations of the earth. The lamb was slain. See, the cross is bigger than time. Therefore, I can safely say to God that all of my past, all of my present, and all of my future sins. Now, if you hold to the position that, hey, if I don't confess them all, then I say that also is dangerous because what if you forget one? Do you realize one sin could send any man to hell? All of us have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. And this has brought so much confusion. Now, the reason this great revelation is coming to the earth is because the body of Christ, most people have become so sin conscious. And the manifestation of that is guilt and shame. And if the enemy can keep you in guilt and shame, I can tell you how many impossible prayers you'll be praying. So really, you don't need a revelation about the forgiveness of God. You need a revelation about the love of God. Are you listening? Now, saying that, knowing this, it's still healthy <laughs> for my soul to come into his presence and not live in denial. So, does Gene confess sin? Yes, but possibly not in the manner you think. If you saw me confessing my sin and just coming before the Lord in complete honesty, you would probably not see me like you saw someone in an old revival service down here weeping for 30 minutes. That person is living under guilt and shame and fear 
and worry and condemnation. That's where the enemy wants to keep them. See, I want to walk in this clean conscience, this righteousness in Christ. I want to walk in this confidence like David in the grace of God and in the mercy of God. How do I get that confidence? By being honest with him. It's healthy. Who would have ever thought that honesty could produce such impossibilities. That's how good he is. That's why he cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. He said, I'll remember it no more. But he just likes children that have no deceit that some of these translations do Psalms 32 like it's the joy of forgiveness. Some of them it's called a, a maskel in, in the Hebrew language. It, it's the word that they would use for like a Hebrew scholar. And David had received this revelation, this maskel, this, this thought, this unbelievable insight into the heart of God. None of us want our children running from us in their failures. We want them running to us. That's when God gets to be God. That's when grace overtakes us. That's when we drink of mercy. That's when we know how wonderful, beautiful, gracious, kind, when sin kisses mercy and the manifestation is blessing and abundance and prosperity and the goodness of God. That's why the Bible said it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, to a change of mind. Don't let the enemy keep you in shame because here's what he doesn't. He doesn't want to unleash. He doesn't want to see faith unleashed in you. He doesn't want to see the power of faith inside you. He's going to try to keep every bit of the power of God locked up in you. Don't let him do that. Let's keep going. I want you to see the rest of this. Watch. Maybe you can go down and see all of it. Now, so we'll be on record. There are four hindrances to prayer. And this has even become controversial, like, oh, well, that verse is in Proverbs. That one's in Psalms. Listen to me. The heavens can shut up over your life. I don't want to go down that road. I don't want to teach you on it today, but you just got to believe me that I put them there. They're in James. They're in James. You can go and write them down. But if you ignore God's word, the heavens will shut up. If we regard iniquity, if we cherish that, sin in our heart, some translations, if we just cherish it and pet it and adultery is okay and fornication is okay, it hinders, it hinders love. It hinders what God wants to do. When we desire the wrong things or we walk in this doubt, the Bible said if we're a double-minded man, if we're wavering, then, you know, don't expect to ask anything from God. These are deal breakers, period. And just we need to know that. I mean, I could stand up here and tell you five stories of impossible prayers and you go home tomorrow and start praying these impossible prayers and you could pray them your entire life. But there are some things you got to understand when you step over into this. Because you know why? Because we're not going to cherry pick the Bible. Let's keep going. Let's watch this. I want you to see this psalm. You ready? Here it is. So here it is, verse 4. Day and night. <laughs> this it gets a little. Day and night. This is David. Because he confessed his sin. He was honest with God. Day and night, your hand of discipline was so heavy on me. I don't have time to teach on that. So much, my strength, it was evaporating like water in the summer heat. Finally, he was confident in grace. He was confident in the mercy of God. Finally, I confessed all my sins. I started saying what you say is sin. 
And when we do that, get ready, something's going to unleash. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you, and I stopped trying to hide. Do you see how they're tied together? Watch the unconfessed sin in my life, not saying what you say about it, God, not trying to cover it up. I dealt with that. Oh, and also, I dealt with guilt. You see, it's the best context in the Bible is always the Bible or the commentary. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. You forgave me all of it. It's gone. Now watch. I like this. This is a great verse in the Word of God. David used this more than anybody. Therefore, you know, a great theologian said this one time. He said, when you see therefore in the Bible, you need to go see what it is there for. You got that? Therefore, therefore, because I dealt with this, the guilt. I started saying what you said is sin. When you come to that place, let all the godly start to give more? No. Start to read their Bible more? No. Start to attend church more? Start to help the poor more? No. I need to join the greeting team? No. I need to join the children's ministry? No. When you come to this place, that's why David said, blessed is the man. It's a state of mind. When you come to the place and you're at that state of mind, it's a good place to be because it's there your prayer life is going to a new level. Let all the godly pray to you while there is still time. What does that mean? Many people will live their entire life, sit in a church pew and never pray the impossible. Let's go to verse 7. You ready? We're going to wrap this up. For you're my hiding place. You protect me. I don't have time to do this. From trouble. I love this. This is what grabs me more than anything in the 11 verses. Because you surround me with songs, plural, plural, with these songs of victory all the time. <laughs> My life is made up of all these songs of victory after victory after victory. It didn't matter if I was in a cave at Adullam. It didn't matter if I was at Ziklag and everything had been stolen from me. I'm standing in the valley staring at a giant. Saul's throwing a spear at me. My brothers are denying that the anointing of God's on me. It doesn't matter. Bear, lion, it doesn't matter. If you want to sum my life up, I've written songs, plural, of victory after victory after victory. It's not the will of God for us to live in defeat. There's nothing that will challenge you more in your life than when you start seeing that with God, all things are possible and, and walls begin to come down. Addictions begin to be defeated and, and breakthroughs begin to happen and the supernatural power of God steps into your world and begins to do supernatural things for you. So rejoice in the Lord. Be glad, all you who obey Him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. Let's keep going. I want you to see this. This is James. And if someone was to say today, you might watch the teaching. He said, well, Gene, I just don't believe in confessing my sins to God anymore. Okay. Well, that's, like I said, we'll, we'll agree to disagree. But I still say that's a pretty dangerous place when you see this verse right here. Because James, this is New Covenant. James said, you need to confess your sins to one another. So we need to be honest with one another. That's going to be my position. But you, you would say, well, oh, okay, yeah. I need to be honest with other believers, but I don't need to be honest with God. I don't know where the body of Christ got off on this. But 
I think it's just healthy to bring it down to, like Prince said, let's just be honest with God. Confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another. Why? This is the text about healing the elders in the church. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, the effectual prayer, the King James, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Watch this. This is Elijah. Next. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly. God kind of slots this out and says, hey, this is a new level of prayer. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruits. See, it was impossible, but with God it was possible. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thought here. Look, watch this. I like this right here. This is a quote, and I'll tell you a story. Wrap it up. This is Blackaby. He said, don't discount what is possible with God. When God gives an assignment, it is no longer an impossibility. Wow. But rather, it is an absolute certainty. Do you realize there are certainties in heaven waiting to be released in your life that if you knew what they were in the natural, you would call them impossible? When God gives you a seemingly impossible task, the only thing preventing it from coming to pass is your disobedience. Let me close with this story. I've been pastoring this church for almost 20 years. The first two to five years, I don't know exact, but when I first got back here, I started meeting a lot of my old friends that I went to high school with. And there are two friends I guess I've known them as long as anybody uh, on this planet, me personally. You know, they go way back in my life. But there were two girls uh, that I knew uh, in high school. One is Angie and one is Betsy, their sisters. And uh, for a season, I used to date one of them back in high school. And uh, like a fool one night... I mean a fool. Uh, I got mad at my girlfriend, and I took my four-wheel drive truck and drove it across her dad's front yard. Needless to say, he was willing, ready, and able to kill me, and I would have probably deserved every bit of his wrath. It was totally stupid. I go to Texas, meet my wife, go to seminary, spent 10 years in evangelism, come back and see these two girls that are now ladies in the community, still friends of mine. And they're praying these audacious prayers for their dad's salvation. One night, we were still living in Kodak. I got a phone call. It was from Betsy. And she said, Gene, they've rushed my dad to the hospital would you please come and see him? Naturally, I'm thinking vengeance, and he is going to absolutely remember that I was the crazy kid that destroyed his yard across from the high school. I hung the phone up, and my little righteous wife said, you've got to go. This is one of the highlights of my life. I go down there, and this man is cursing God. Like I've, I've never seen people use this language. And I mean, he is on death's door. And I can remember like this happened last night. I mean, literally last night. I see these two sisters laying over their father praying for his salvation. And they are praying. They're weeping, and I'm, I'm watching this while this man is using this language. And I leave that, and I'm just being honest with you. I get on the interstate, and I drive back to Kodak down Interstate 40, get off on exit 407, and God forgive me, but I thought this, so I'm just going to be honest. I thought the thought, and again, God forgive me. I thought the thought. I've never said this publicly. 
If any man deserves to go to hell, Lord, the way he talked tonight, he would deserve it. The Lord since then has really hit me with this. We all deserve None righteous. We try to classify sins. But I remember going to bed that night and I thought, Lord, that's a terrible thought for a pastor. About a week later, those girls just held on and kept praying and kept praying, kept praying. And late at night, that same girl, Betsy, her his youngest daughter, called me, said, Gene, Dad's here. And he wants to see you. As soon as I heard that, like, oh, my God, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be in trouble for sure, Lord. I was trying to think how retroactive it would be to destroy a person's yard, you know. And she said, Gene, he wants to see you. And I could hear him in the background. I could hear him in the background. He, he was singing Amazing Grace. And then he would stop and he'd say, Betsy, is that Gene? Tell him to come. Now, I want to get saved, Betsy. I, I rush down to the hospital. I get off on the elevator, and God is my witness. At the end of the hall, I hear this man singing Amazing Grace after these girls have prayed seven days. They are waiting. His brother, his two daughters, his wife. I mean, I'm talking about a sinner, notorious, okay? And this man is waiting on me I walk in, lead him to Christ, and he is gloriously saved. Comes to our church, gets baptized. Years later, tells his daughters, no one is doing my funeral but Gene. Left me the most unbelievable, never in my lifetime has anybody blessed me. And he said, Betsy, make sure you give this to Gene. I mean, his, his hatred for me, as a little boy, which was obvious, okay, he had the right to be just as much as it was here. His love for me at the end of his life was like I was his Billy Graham. What is that? That's the impossible. And I'm wondering in this, just to bring it down to this, have we given up, not on our dream? Not on the sun standing still. Not on walking on water. Or us laying hands on someone and they be healed of cancer. All of those are good things. But have we given up on one person that doesn't know Christ? Beloved, I challenge you. Lock into someone you know this year that they don't know Christ and it almost seems like an impossibility they'd come to salvation. Lock into that like those two girls and believe for the, when the doctor said it's almost over, they held on and prayed for their daddy. And today, their dad is in an eternal place in heaven. And if the Lord tarries his coming, that man will wait on his wife and wait on his two daughters. But they pushed back hell in Fort Sanders and said to the devil, you can't have my dad. What would happen if that kind of fervency, that kind of audacious prayer would take over in all our families? Our entire households would be saved. I, I challenge you. I just speak faith into you right now that it would explode inside of you and we'd understand that with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible to them who believe. Amen. Hey, we hope you enjoyed that message from our senior pastor, Gene Wolfenbarger. To watch more messages, you can just visit our website, thegatheringfamily.com, and they're all listed right there. 
something that we do as a family every time we meet together or we meet online together is we want to take communion. So grab whatever you have around you right now, if that's a cracker and some water. The important thing is that we remember. It's easy to go through life day to day to day, and we forget the things that happened yesterday. And Jesus knew that when he was talking to his disciples. So he said, hey, every time you guys do this, do this in remembrance of me. So communion is simply remembering what Jesus did through his body and through his blood. His body was beaten and scourged for us on our behalf. And as he hung on that cross, bloody and wounded, he was thinking of you. He had you in mind. So we thank you, Lord, for your body broken and beaten for us, that we may have all the promises that you give to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may take the cracker. The next thing, the next part of communion is the blood of Jesus. Now, I love the blood of Jesus. Uh, this is the blood that gives us access into the presence of God. It's the blood that adopts us as sons and daughters, that calls us completely righteous before a holy God. And it was spilled out for us that we may spend eternity not just talking about communion, but actually communing with our Father. So Lord, we thank you for your blood that gives us access, that adopts us as sons and daughters, and that washes us of our sins as pure as snow. In Jesus' name, you may take the blood. Hey, well, we are putting together five experiences every week right now during this time when we're apart to connect with you. You can find all of those on our Facebook page. You can check out our website, thegatheringfamily.com. You can look on Instagram. But something else I want to say is if you don't have a church home, if you're not connected anywhere, we want to be that. We want to be those people who you can uh, find community with. And so there are a couple ways to do that. We put a connection card link right there in the, in the chat, wherever you're watching. You can go to our website and fill out just a prayer request. That'll give us your email and a prayer request, and we'll connect with you that way. But whatever way it is, if you need a place to call home, we want to be that place. So until we see you in person, family, until we see you again, be blessed. Thank you.